Cool. There we go. Um, kia ora, tēnā koutou, katoa, and um, welcome everyone today to what will be a really fun and busy hour as we learn a little bit more about the New Zealand tech and innovation story. Um, like in any other competitive business field, it's no longer enough just to sell yourself on your product or services, talking about the features, benefits, or price. You need, you need things to mean a little bit more than that, uh, having values, purpose, and differentiators to connect with your target audience. With this in mind, the New Zealand Tech and Innovation Story, or our tech story, is a marketing initiative from industry and government designed to deliver a consistent and compelling way of promoting our tech and innovation capabilities to the world. Welcome along uh, to, to our chat about it. My name is Simon Pound. Uh, I work with a range of great New Zealand brands uh, and tech companies, and I'm hosting today with three guests. Uh, first up is Julie Gill of NZ Tech. Uh, then we're going to be hearing um, from the outside view from Randy Commissar, who's a 35-year Silicon Valley veteran. And finally, we're going to be hearing from Louise Francis from IDC, who will be taking us through the research that they've been doing around the perceptions of New Zealand tech here and overseas. Uh, there'll be time for a Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, where we would love to have your questions and involvement. And if there's something that you'd like to have uh, added to the conversation as we go, please do jump into the chat and share that to us. And I'll be keeping an eye out uh, to try and find some great questions to sprinkle in as we go. Uh, otherwise, stick around uh, and have, we'll have a great Q&A at the end. So getting straight into, um, getting straight into it uh, with, with time of pressing, uh, we're joined first by Julie Gill, who's the Chief Strategy Officer for NZ Tech, responsible for commercial strategy and the development of NZ Tech and the Tech Alliance here um, to talk about uh, yeah, what we're up to today. So first up, Julie, uh, tēnā koe, thank you for being here. Um, yeah, what is the New Zealand tech and innovation story? Yeah, hi, kia ora, Simon. Thanks very much today to agreeing to uh, facilitate the panel and uh, great to see you with your tech. Tech Week 20, uh, 2021 branding behind you. So I hope you enjoy a good, uh, good Tech Week this week. It's been a, been a great, great start. Um, launching with uh, TEDx on Saturday and the Tech 21 Summit yesterday, which was uh, inspiring kids and teachers um, and kids into tech careers for the next generation. So this is a really, really, uh, this is a really good forum now to talk about our international story for, for New Zealand. So yeah, so what is the tech story? Um, well, it is, it is actually a really important key work stream of the digital technology industry, industry transformation plan um, for New Zealand. And it really is about how we create New Zealand's tech story that we're going to take to the world um, to really let everybody know um, what amazing uh, tech is going on here in the country. Um, it is uh, is funded and supported by MB. Um, and it's, it, you know, and there's there's real kind of drive behind this right now in terms of being led by NZ Tech, but with industry. So businesses, associations, networks and influencers to really create a story for for New Zealand businesses um, that they can use and they can really unite behind. Um, but we have fantastic support with the story um, in collaboration with all our government agencies, NZTE, NZ Story, Callaghan, uh, Ministry of Education. So a real, real government support behind the industry and lead and industry leading, um, leading the way on this. Um, so yeah, so really, really excited to share more information with the business community today. Um, so in terms of, I suppose, probably um, what's, our, what's our mission with the tech story? And as you said, it is about creating this consistent message um, and a compelling message. But I think, you know, it's more about uniting the tech industry behind this, the tech industry now. And tech is obviously so broad um, and across so many sectors. So um, it really is that everybody can feel that they can relate to that story um, and they can unite behind it. Um, so some, some big goals, Simon, and big mission and statements around that, um, that we wanna really aim, aim high with this story. Um, in itself, the story really is to help build awareness and confidence 
um, in New Zealand's tech story, uh, tech stories ability internationally, um, so that um, internationally, this, you know, people will look at New Zealand and really understand what our ability is in the tech space. Um, also, you know, with everything that's gone on in the world in, in the last year and a half around COVID, it is also um, around looking about how we help, how the story can help with our recovery. Um, and I think, you know, if there's ever a time for us to go out and tell our tech story internationally, the time is now. Um, you know, our response to the pandemic, um, you know, has heightened real global interest in New Zealand um, and has definitely positioned us as a very, you know, nimble, decisive country um, that can solve complex problems, which tech fits brilliantly into that, but also a country that thinks differently. Um, so we're really wanting to start off this uh, tech week this week to talk to the business audiences about the time is right now to come and work with us, work with NZ Tech and that governance group, um, you know, work with us in creating this story, get in behind it um, and, um, and really drive this when the momentum um, is very positive um, around New Zealand. So, so I'm a bit of a long winded answer <laughs> to your question there, but, you know, I suppose there's a lot to say right now about, I think, you know, the story, um, you know, taking it internationally, the timing being right now, building on some, you know, a lot of positivity around New Zealand. And why is it important to have a, a story for, for New Zealand tech? And why is it important for these government uh, agencies and also the industry to come together to craft it and then share it? Yeah, I think it's a good question because I think, you know, when we talk about the objectives of the tech story, we've really set ourselves, I suppose, clear, three very, very clear goals with this. And this has been in collaboration with the industry over the last three or four, four months. We've been doing a lot of research and um, deep diving with, with groups within the tech industry. Um, and I suppose for us, it's probably, you know, it's three clear, very clear things, which is how do we, you know, how do we increase tech investment into our tech companies um, and indirectly from that how do we attract tech talent we want to build from within we want to build obviously within New Zealand and you know encouraging people into tech careers but we also want to attract um, tech talent um, and I think from that we you know our goal is then to you know to increase our, our tech exports internationally so you know sort of three clear goals but also I think we've all agreed that really there's a step one job to do, Simon, which is actually to let the world know that we actually have a tech sector. Um, you know, New Zealand is often, you know, we are very proud of the fact that we punch above our weight, um, okay. but we really want to get to get to a point where um, people aren't surprised we have a tech story, they actually expect it from New Zealand. So, you know, that's one of the goals. How do we, how do we create that story that actually educates the world internationally that, you know, you don't need to be surprised. We've got some great things going on here in New Zealand. Oh, and how do you see it coming to life? Like how might New Zealand tech businesses use, uh, draw from a New Zealand tech story and use it themselves? Yeah, so again, yeah, really good question, because I think, uh, you know, there's lots of ways. I mean, you know, people say, what is the tech story? You know, what does that mean? And I suppose from a basic perspective, you know, it is a marketing message. It's the, it will be what the New Zealand brand will be, the key narrative, the key messages. Um, but in terms of how to get it, you know, to get involved in users, it is going to be all down to the audiences that were actually um, targeting with that story. Um, so internationally, what countries or what sectors, um, you know, or, you know, what buyers we're trying to influence. Um, so there will be lots of ways to, to get involved and use it. But I suppose three probably simple ways. One will be direct with businesses. So they will be able to use this story to, to kind of weave into their own narrative, their own marketing, their own sales pitches. Um, you know, there will be a, a toolkit of assets to use from narrative to infographics to statistics to video to photography um, really everything that you would hope and, and require around a suite of marketing and sales assets um, but also we will be working really really closely with all the government agencies to to work through them through their channels into their networks internationally um, through trade shows hopefully Simon will be back out there yeah <laughs> um, you know out, out, you know but e even even if that's not the case there's a lot of virtual delegations going on now virtual mm -hmm. trade shows um, so we'll be working really really 
work closely with NZTE and, and all the government agencies to, to utilize those, those channels. Um, and then also we, through creating the tech story with NZ Tech and the governance group, we will actually be pushing out a campaign internationally as well. So we're hoping there's going to be opportunities where we can just open that door a little bit for New Zealand, you know, put the foot in the door, you know, which means the businesses maybe can come in behind, um, but also they can use it themselves if it's useful, depending on the audiences and what the, the story they're trying to sell. Um, and then also, you know, with support, support of the government agencies. So, yeah, so so hopefully, you know, some good ways to use it, but, you know, three key ways um, in, in that aspect. Yeah. And um, there's you're in an interesting kind of spot at the moment aren't you and that we're talking about the new zealand tech story but the project's still in train and so the actual details of the story are still being worked through as i understand it what, yes. what is the timeline um for the story coming out and then being able to be used yeah so um so i've got one prepared here simon because uh -huh. uh, <laughs> i knew you were going to ask it but i thought it would be good for for, for the tech business industry and especially our um, attendees on the call today and um just to absolutely understand that so um in terms of the work that's been done today i we would call it that kind of definition stage so we've been doing a lot of research um with with our partners and idc in terms of deep diving you know into into industry and all the sectors in terms of what their goals what their objectives are what their challenges are if they are trying to you know sell internationally what would be useful um so a lot of that work's been done over the last couple of months we've now engaged with our brand strategy partner and um, so we're now taking that first step which is how do we then create knowing all the information that we've got which will be shared today by um some snippets by um Louise from IDC and also some insights from from Randy today internationally um, but this is our start of the activation so we've got this we've got a lot of activities going on in tech week so some um, education informed series like today um, but we're starting on some deep diving um, with the with the industry in terms of really trialing the the narrative the assets and 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 seeing how people are going to react to that and, and test it so I think you can see on the side we've talked about building sort of marketing advisory groups, testing that, refining it, um, and then starting to build the story, the case studies, collect that um, and build the campaign assets and guidelines. So that'll happen between like now and the end of August um, with the view that we really want to be able to go to market between August and November. So with some onshore activation, um, we want to get out and start doing some training, some road shows with businesses, um, and, um, and webinars if required so everybody understands what the story is, how to use it, how it can be useful. Um, and then we will, in parallel, start an offshore campaign, um, you know, again, with businesses and through NZTE and their, their network and um, government agencies um, to get the message out. So a lot to go to happen, Simon, between now and November, which is why we thought would be really important, start of Tech Week, start really informing everybody on where we are at, you know, um, obviously offering out people to get involved, um, you know, the more input and the more stakeholder engagement, the better. We're creating this story for, you know, for a lot of the businesses that are on the call today um, and we're creating it for the industry. So we really want the industry and government agencies to get involved as much as possible and, and make sure this story is going to work for them. Yeah, and one quick last little thought here. I mean, you've engaged with, I understand, a, a huge number of businesses here uh, and also um, parties overseas as well. How can people get in touch with you, find out more and um, contribute or stay along the journey if they're interested? Yeah, so we've kind of, so since September, October last year, we we basically did a, a lot of workshops. Obviously, we were still in and out of COVID. So there was some um, some some live and, and webinars mm -hmm. where we engaged with with a lot of the sectors across the tech sector. Um, and then we also did a survey to around 300 um, participants. And with IDC, we've been doing some one on one interviews around 40 businesses locally around 33 internationally uh, Randy was one of them on the call today but I've just sort of picked just quickly put up this slide here because we're obviously starting that journey now to create the story and um, now we've got all the information on the requirements um, so there are there is actually on the digital industry transfer pay, transformation plan 
website there is actually a link in there that you can fill in and say if you want to get involved and we'll, we'll definitely be in contact um, and again the team have put in some some contact information this will go up again at the end of this webinar and there will be some communication going out to all of the participants on the call today um, so yeah so don't be shy um, come on the journey with us get involved um, but we have start we have started to form groups like marketing groups investor groups we'll start to create um, talent groups so that we really can make sure that we're, 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 we, you know, we're on track as best as we can, Simon. We're not going, you know, it's not going to be perfect and we can't boil the ocean with this story, but we definitely want to really be, be clear on what's going to be the most useful for the New Zealand businesses. Yeah, that's great. Hey, thank you so much for joining us to chat that through Julie. That's Ju Julie Gill, Gill of NZ Tech. And uh, as you mentioned there, um, a big part of the project has been talking to the international audience, people who understand from the outside in uh, and what the current impressions and perceptions are from New Zealand among the relevant communities overseas. Uh, and so to represent that, we've actually got Randy Commissar joining us, uh, who's worked in Silicon Valley for 35 years as an entrepreneur, investor, professor and writer, partnering with innovators to build success from their vision. For several years now, he's been working with New Zealand investors, entrepreneurs, policymakers, and educators to create a thriving innovation economy founded on Kiwi values and opportunities, uh, really helping be an emissary for us uh, in the Valley. So thank you very much for being here today, Randy, and really interested to hear, yeah, your, your views, um, looking from the outside in to the NZ tech scene. Yeah, so I guess first up, what's the biggest change you've seen um, in New Zealand's tech industry in the recent years, and how does that fit into some of those international trends that we see? Well, I think there's been a maturation. I've been working in New Zealand for the last five years or so around these various constituencies to try to help build an innovation economy that's appropriate to the scale and the resources of New Zealand. I think the idea of taking the Silicon Valley story to New Zealand really cannot work. It can't work at a scale level. There's not the, the history and the resources aren't there, but I do believe we can build an incredible innovation economy in New Zealand around what New Zealand offers uniquely. And so um, when, I, when I look at New Zealand, I see incredible talent, well-educated people, a very sophisticated infrastructure, a global economy, even though small, uh, and all of those assets are very, very valuable. The, the, what's missing in my mind is the experience of taking all those assets and creating global successes from them. And that experience is coming slowly but surely. It takes time, it takes generations, and that means tens of years of entrepreneurial experience to get there. But New Zealand's well on its way. And in the last couple of years, I've seen a great maturation in the venture capital investing community to begin to actually think about long-term outcomes for their investments and thinking about where they put their money to make sure they're getting the biggest bang for their buck in New Zealand. Yeah, and that kind of um, building on past successes and cycling past successes into new ventures and the like, um, it, it, you know, with that maturation of the scene, how have you found the external impression of the fact that you're working with New Zealand companies and that you've got such an interest here in the wider US scene and how has the external view of New Zealand changed over time in your in your perception? Well New Zealand has a great global brand um, even going into COVID there was a sense that there is this sustainability um, brand in New, New Zealand. There's an agricultural brand, and particularly as we see agriculture move from commodities to intellectual property, that New Zealand's in an incredible position to exploit that on a global basis. But post-COVID, what we've seen is a real appreciation for the culture and society and for good governance. And those things are very, very valuable. I do believe that selling New Zealand technology companies as New Zealand products is probably not the way to go. I think that really what we're doing is trying to take what was the old tourism model of bringing 
um, people to view and enjoy and appreciate what New Zealand is and turn it into a talent model to bring great talent to New Zealand who are looking for the sorts of things that New Zealand provides culturally, uh, governmentally, um, environmentally, and have that and then to be able to, to put that talent to work, creating great innovations. That to me is one of the great opportunities to use the New Zealand brand. I don't think walking into an, a competitive economic environment and just saying you're from New Zealand is particularly helpful. I don't think it hurts. And in particular categories where the brand applies, whether it's agritech or whether it is um, sustainability, uh, medical devices, those things, obviously there is an aura, but fundamentally, I think the brand is best used at bringing great innovative talent into New Zealand to help pull together these resources and create big economic opportunities rather than simply going abroad and saying, hey, I've got this company that's from New Zealand, pay attention. Yeah, H have you found over time that people um, find it more credible that these things come out of New Zealand or are there, you know, what are the kind of challenges around um, the messaging coming out of New Zealand that you've experienced? Well, I do think that when people understand and have an appreciation for what makes New Zealand special, hear about innovation or products or services coming from New Zealand, um, they give them the benefit of the doubt, right? Because there is a sense there's just a quality behind it. You know, New Zealand is a place that punches above its weight class. It's about quality, not quantity. And I do believe that one of the challenges for New Zealand is focus. Boiling the ocean to become a global competitor in, in, in technology is not the way in which I think New Zealand is going to establish itself and build a robust uh, innovation economy. I think it's going to have to choose its battles. You know, you you, the, you know, you you just you choose to go with the All Blacks in rugby. You don't choose to go with the American Football League, mm -hmm. and there's a good reason for that. You know, you, you what you choose to be um, number one or number two at is going to be critical here. So I think that's actually going to be one of the hardest things for in a, for for New Zealand tech is to decide where are the areas that it wants to distinguish itself and to double down there rather than to spread itself too thin elsewhere. Yeah, and what areas um, would you recommend? Well, I think there are areas that are already emerging pretty pretty easily. Sustainability, um, green tech and uh, environmental products and services are, um, are now, I think, arriving at their maturation on a global basis. We saw a blip in the, in the US in the early 2000s. We saw that die down. We're seeing that now come back robustly. Um, when you take a look at what's going on in the US in terms of policy, there's gonna be a tremendous amount of investment in reviving the economy around green tech, et cetera. I think the, the connections to New Zealand there can be very, very helpful. I also think that because of the regulatory scheme Teams in and good government in New Zealand, um, areas like aerospace, areas that wouldn't necessarily stand out, though New Zealand has a history of putting a jet engine on everything, you know, whether it's a bicycle <laughs> or a boat or whatever. Nevertheless, I do think that because the government is very rational about creating opportunities for startups with limited liability to try new technologies and things like aerospace, that's a very attractive place to, to operate from. In the medical device area, um, with Fisher Paykel and others, there's clearly an indication that this is a place where New Zealand can distinguish themselves. So those sorts of areas are very, um, are very useful. Now, if you take a look also at things like um, software as a service, SaaS, which gets thrown around a lot in New Zealand, I don't think New Zealand is particularly um, uh, uh, benefited in that category. I don't think it's um, it, it has a disadvantage, but I don't think it's an area where in the long term you can build a competitive moat. So it's really about choosing your opportunities. Ah, that's so cool. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today and for being part of the project uh, so far. That's Randy Commissar. Kia ora, thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. Awesome. Um, great. To get. And then, so a really big part of this project has been the talking to people here and overseas uh, to get the lay of the land, to find out what people think about New Zealand now um, as, as the basis for the story. Uh, so joining us now is Louise Francis, who's the New Zealand Country Manager for and Research Director 
for IDC Australia and New Zealand, who's led the project uh, and is here to uh, give us a roundup of what people have told us. Kia ora, Louise, thank you for joining us. Unmute. Aha, um, there we are today. <laughs> nice to see you. First mistake. Um, no, th thanks for inviting me for this discussion today. Um, it, it's really fascinating journey that we've been on. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share our our journey that we've um, we've been on over the last couple of months. Share the screen. Um, and just talking about the tech and innovation story, and I think one of the challenges that we had when we were putting this together was uh, everyone's got a different opinion. We, we felt like any kind of a story, it's a journey, you don't know where you're going to go, you don't know what sort of uh, feedback you're going to get. And as with any kind of story creation, um, we've been through that process over the last couple of months. So just to give you an example, sorry, just to get my just to give you an example of the the depth of research and what we went through um, particularly at IDC when IDC joined the project in uh, late February and we started doing the research in March and we started with this core of research that was already there so we had uh, the the research from the uh, NZ Tech uh, stakeholder workshops uh, and then we had a survey that was done by uh, NZ Tech, but also incorporating data from uh, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise Global Surveys. And this formed the basis of where do we want to go when we do our interview stage? What do we want? Who do we want to talk to? What do we want to get out of those interviews? And uh, as a result of that, we decided that we wanted to interview both domestic stakeholders in New Zealand and then also the international stakeholders to get that outside view, like Randy was talking about um, just now. Um, so in terms of the domestic stakeholder interviews, we interviewed 40 companies. Uh, we, 28 of those were CEOs or managing directors. So really at that, that top level of the organization, uh, 12 of those companies were tech investors, educators and influencers. And they came across a multiple, a multitude of, of vertical industries. So we wanted to get as many different opinions from different sectors, different parts of the market, um, different uh, types of roles in the organization. So we could understand from the tech sector's perspective where they thought New Zealand stood in terms of our strengths, but also where they thought the messaging should be going out to the rest of the world. So to counter that, we went to international stakeholders like Randy, and we interviewed uh, 33 international stakeholders. Um, they were business leaders, they were uh, VC investors, they were influencers. Uh, so they were people who had some sort of a connection to New Zealand. Uh, they would had either visited New Zealand, worked with New Zealand tech companies, um, or had actually just had some conversation with New Zealand tech companies. Um, a third of them were business leaders, the rest were investors, advisors, educators, and business founders. Uh, we did interviews in five different countries, and five of those who participated were New Zealanders, New Zealand expats, or had international businesses. Um, what we found out of all this information, we did 64 hours of interviews in the space of two months, um, and what we found is that there was no consistent opinion. Uh, there were some themes that came through quite consistently across the different stakeholder groups, but also there were quite a few differences between the, the perceptions of where New Zealand's strengths were and where New Zealand should be focusing, particularly when you're talking about developing a story. Uh, and that's where one of the biggest challenges came into play was how do you develop a story that is, uh, is uh, detailed enough to attract different uh, groups of people or different groups of investors, but also broad enough that you're not getting into too much detail. Yeah, well, let's look so, at some of those themes that, that, that came up there is that's a really interesting um, point about, you know, are you telling a story that you want to tell about yourselves or that people in the world are interested to hear or might believe? Well, that's it. And as you can imagine, particularly depending on where the person was coming from who we interviewed, if they were a, a tech company or a startup, 
they wanted to get out a different message to the rest of the world than say a, a larger, more established tech company, or even when you're talking to the education sector, or you're talking to those who are trying to attract talent to New Zealand. Uh, so there are multiple threads that, you know, we needed to pull together to create some sort of consistent theming. Um, yeah, I think Julie talked about this earlier. We're only in the middle of, middle stages of this, this project and this work. Um, we, this, this, this stage was all about gathering that information and finding out you know, what we should be including, but also what should we be excluding. Uh, because the previous tech story had some threads of uh, themes in that, that when we tested them with the audience, they, they weren't so that much important now. Um, some of them were still important and some have been elevated in importance. But the overall thing based on the previous story was the, the themes were that the, the reasons behind those themes and those, uh, that messaging had actually changed as well. We're in a completely different world now. Um, have, we have you know, this borderless economy uh, attracting talent to New Zealand. You know, a lot of the conversation was, do you actually have to bring them here physically or should it be a, a virtual talent that we're seeking out? Um, I put this slide up to just show some of those themes that did emerge in the, the interviews themselves. These are common phrases, common uh, meanings that came through in, in several of the interviews. Um, but, you know, things such as we, we are considered innovative, but as Randy was talking about before, you know, how do you focus that innovation? How do you ensure that you're focusing on the right things and the things that are most relevant or the most effective to the New Zealand audience, uh, the New Zealand tech uh, industry. Trust came through time and time again. Um, we saw during COVID-19 that New Zealand got elevated in terms of um, our visibility, uh, but also the level of trust that uh, businesses would have with dealing with a New Zealand tech company. But many businesses, particularly the international um, stakeholders who we interviewed, said that that trust can be very, very fleeting. So trust relates to our openness, our transparency. Um, and these are the sorts of things that do attract investors to New Zealand. Um, our values down in the left-hand corner, um, you know, that is uh, something that we, we talked uh, a lot about in the interviews. How do you incorporate our values into the story? How do you make it fit? And the overwhelming response was, it shouldn't be just something you just add on top of the story. It should be the basis, it's, it's what we are, it's who we are, it's our emotional connection to technology. And it's about how we develop technology that, that creates care, that is about sustainability, that is about the environment, that is about um, creating those, those connections with humanity. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but, you know, fresh, you know, we talk about the ecosystem, uh, as, as Randy said, you know, we, we still have some way to go to get that connected ecosystem that is up to the, the uh, withstand what investors are looking for in the New Zealand market, but it is considered fresh, it's considered malleable, and it's considered something that we can shape and evolve depending on how technology itself evolves. And with such a broad tech sector, you know, the, the tech sector can take in so many different industries and types of business, it's perhaps not surprising that there are a few themes all kind of coming out at once and not a single uh, clear message. Was there anything kind of consistent between the domestic and the international audience that was interesting? Or is that too um, a kind of case of many different stories? It is a case of many different stories, but there are also a lot of commonalities. And I think that the one thing that um, we found the most in common was that, that everyone who we talked to had a passion for making New Zealand tech work. Uh, it, when we talked domestically, you know, just talking, people talking about the passion that they had for the New Zealand tech industry, um, helping each other out, and, you know, that, that collaboration is is something that we, we were really good at in the past year during COVID-19. Um, so there's that passion on the domestic side, but when we talk to international tech investors in particular, you know, they, they really want to, um, to, to give us you know, advice of, you know, these are the things you need to be focusing on. Thinking what Randy was talking about, those are the sorts of things that uh, the, the international tech investors were saying that we should be focusing on. 
um, you know, using their advice, using, you know, their experience to, to build a, a great story, but this, it has to be more than a story. It has to be backed by um, a, a tech ecosystem that can, can back that out back that up and the way we do that is by being focused on those niche solutions that New Zealand is known for it ties into the New Zealand brand but it also means that we're not trying to scale to things that we're not capable of um, you know it is about that quality and not the quantity uh, and how much is you know the people you spoke to internationally you know, some like Randy have long links to New Zealand. And just a note to everyone on the call, we will be having Randy and Louise uh, and Julie all together back at the end for questions. So keep those questions coming in the chat and then we'll have a chance to ask them at the end. Um, you know, we, we, had, we heard from, from Randy who's had a long association with the country. You know, how, how aware are people internationally of New Zealand as a place of tech excellence? And, you know, how how easy is that for people to kind of bring to mind compared to the other kind of things that New Zealand maybe immediately conjures up in people's minds that maybe aren't all about tech? Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, I think there, there is still a, a level of low visibility of New Zealand tech industry, unless it relates to something that we're also very strong at. So when you talk about, for example, the film industry, you know, we're known for film technology through things such as where workshops, uh, where uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, our, film, um, back, our film technology background is, is very strong. Uh, if you're talking about uh, anything in the sporting industry, if you're focusing on America's Cup technology, you know, that makes sense. It's when the story makes sense with the technology we're trying to promote. It's still going to be, um, you know, we are a small country. We do have uh, not necessarily the, the depth of uh, the tech ecosystem that we see in some of the bigger countries. All those countries are also trying to do the stuff that we're doing. So how do you stand out? You stand out in, in those areas where we are particularly strong. You don't try to, you know, you don't try to do everything. You don't try to um, you don't try to, to look at uh, producing those commodities. You're never going to compete on that scale. You need, to, you need to focus on that niche. I think here are some of those, those things that, you know, I've just talked about. But um, when we talk to both the internationals and domestics, these are some of the common themes that, that came through. Um, and I think it's, it's how, do you, how do you incorporate this into a story when it's seamless? There are so many ideas here. Um, and that's what we've been filtering through over the last few weeks is how do you narrow it down to something that is really compelling and uh, really creates the visibility with the markets where you want to be visible. Uh, if you're trying to be visible, say, in the US market, that should not be your target. You should be focusing a, a particular part of the market where your message is going to resonate the, strong, the strongest. Oh, were any of the themes that have come through kind of surprising to you with your experience tracking uh, perceptions of New Zealand overseas across time or uh, surprising to you with your experience working with local companies? I don't think from my perspective, I don't think I found anything particularly surprising. Um, I think as I said before, I think just the amount of support out there in the international market for New Zealand tech um, companies um, you know, some of the people we were talking to, they were very fond of, you know, their experience working with New Zealand tech companies. Um, it was, you know, something fresh, the freshness and the, the enthusiasm behind it. Um, and I also think, you know, the, the thing that also came through in those interviews was just our, we do still have that lack of ambition to, to think big. And when I say think big, I'm not talking about scaling up. I'm sort of about thinking about, What's the next steps in terms of our innovation story? What, what should we be focusing on for the future? So I don't think there were any big surprises. Um, not, not that I can recall, um, but I think it's, it's just, um, it's just the, the level of support. I think if I, I'd had to pull out something, that would be it. Uh, and this idea around the Aotearoa's tech ecosystem is growing and maturing but still agile enough to be, um, you, you know, nimble and have fresh ideas. That seems really interesting. Like internationally, are we seen as a place that's really got it happening in tech or is it something that's still kind of on a growth trajectory and how much of kind of 
the job of a story ends up just being awareness for people overseas that they could believe that New Zealand does create great technology. Uh, so when we're talking about the ecosystem growing and maturing, I think, you know, the, the feedback that we got was, and this is probably where there was a bit of a divergence between um, New Zealand and international. Um, it was that, you know, we do have a tech ecosystem. It is still very siloed. Uh, when you look at an ecosystem such as in Silicon Valley and other technology hubs, they have an ecosystem that has grown and um, has not merged together, but they, they work very well together um, to create um, opportunities for the tech industry. New Zealand is um, still evolving. Um, we are a young nation, don't forget, but also our tech industry is relatively young. So uh, that, that's what we're talking about when we talk about growing and maturing. Um, so, sorry, what was the second part of your question? Oh, yeah, like, like how much of it... Um... As this research is built on research that happened reasonably recently about our international uh, view in, like, is it internationally seen that New Zealand is becoming more of a tech uh, exporter and, and, and destination and having an industry? Um, and how much of the job is to convince people? Because we, we all love kind of, you know, uh, knowing the stories inside. But how, how much of the job do you think is to actually convince people overseas uh, that, that it is believable that great tech can be coming from New Zealand. Yeah, it, it's, I think it, it comes back to thinking, trying to be too big and trying to focus on um, trying to do everything. We, we can't, it, it's like any kind of business, when you think about a business, they can't do everything that they want to do. They need to bring the skills and they need to bring, um, they need to, through acquisitions, other things. New Zealand tech companies, uh, you know, in particular, a couple pointed out that um, we're probably about five or six years behind in developing that ecosystem. And Randy was talking about, you know, this create this takes decades to create this type of an ecosystem that is humming along and is really attractive to the tech investors. The visibility, you know, that how do you do the attract? It, it has to be those niche solutions. It has to be focusing on niche parts of the market, you're not going to convince the entire US market or the top, entire Asian market that New Zealand tech is, is, um, is, uh, is, is suitable for them. Um, it's going to be suitable for specific industries, specific um, sectors, and that's where we should be focusing not only our technology, but also our messaging and any kind of story that we develop. Things like the success of Zero and Rocket Lab and, you know, the, the, the sales of some of our kind of marquee tech sales companies overseas are very kind of um, big in our thinking. Did you see that popping up in the research? Like, is there a feeling that there's a lot more news and a lot more maturity being seen at the moment? I think yes, in a way, but uh, one of the things we found was it was the same companies that were mentioned over and over. Um, it was the Zeros, the Rocket Labs, uh, that type of approach. Uh, one person pointed out, you know, I can count on probably one hand that the number of those, those what we call born global type organizations that come out of New Zealand that are recognizable. Um, it's, it is very small. We're a small market. We're not going to produce, you know, dozens of those types of companies. Um, so, you know, that, that is the, the message that is out there. It's, it's not something that is probably going to be achievable with our current um, ecosystem, uh, and nor is it something that we should be aspiring to. Um, you know, we, we should be aspiring to where we're very good at. Yeah, t talk us through some of these challenges and opportunities that you've identified. Yeah, so when we were, you were talking before about what were the differences between um, the domestic people who we talked to and the internationals, and it, this sort of sums up, you know, those diverging opinions. Some of them are quite subtle, um, but it does indicate that if we, we're doing our messaging based on what we think the rest of the world wants, then we're, st we're starting to miss some of the pictures. Um, Randy talked about, you know, talents. Talent came through in a number of the interviews about this is one of our key strengths. Uh, but when, you, when you're focusing on talent, looking at those hard to get niche areas. So thinking about talent around agri-tech, thinking about talent around film tech, those areas that I talked about before, those are the, you know, those are the things that we should be emphasizing, uh, not the talent that is 
is going to be competing with the rest of the world. New Zealand's very uh, considered very easy to do business with, and that comes back to that transparency and that openness. Um, and distance and scale to a small market is becoming less and less valid. So if you, you know, talk to New Zealand, we keep talking about how we are small, we don't have a scale, we are too far away. Many of the people who we talked to said that that's not really becoming so much of an issue now, particularly amongst the, the younger investors who are, you know, they're more open to dealing with countries on the other side of the world. Uh, location is not so important and size is not so important. Um, you know, I think they're, you know, not having enough, enough ambition. Uh, we're not very good at risk taking still and we don't have the audacity. Uh, this is particularly relevant to those investors and they say that this is you know, one of the challenges that we face when dealing with New Zealand tech companies. Mm. Um, and I think you know, it is considered unattractive for nomadic talent that want to jump in and out of New Zealand, um, thinking about our migration laws and visa uh, conditions, it's not really suitable for that. But um, when we talk about you know, New Zealand being a great place to live, um, you know, that's attracting the mentors, that's attracting those who are getting towards the end of their career, they want to share their experience, um, and they want to work with some smaller companies that are not hung up on red tape or the bureaucracies of a larger market. Um, if you look over to the New Zealand side, you know, we, we talk about the skill shortage bringing people into New Zealand. That's not necessarily what we should be doing according to the internationals. Um, and we, we still feel that we produce global companies, but as I said before, you know, we don't produce many of those true global companies. Uh, just because you go overseas, first, um, might move to work in Australia first, it doesn't make you a global company. Um, we do have a closed ecosystem um, and the view is that that is helping us because it helps us test quickly and scale globally. Um, but overall, New Zealand domestics are in agreement with, um, sorry, New Zealand companies say that we need to get better at scaling. But when we talk to international people, they say we shouldn't be looking at scale. We should be looking at that quality, that, that, those niche, niche solutions. Yeah, and a really interesting um, comment in the chat here from Simon Small uh, saying that he totally disagrees a thousand with the notion that we are six years off being a world-class tech ecosystem and that we haven't got six more zero type companies. Uh, and he's going to talk about that at 1.30 on Tech Week TV. But I think mm -hmm. that raises a really interesting point that what we've heard from people who are quite friendly to New Zealand, most of the international people spoken to have some link here and have been following the industry, is if we're hearing from them that they think maybe New Zealand's a few years off being a true uh, world-class tech destination, then people who don't know anything about New Zealand probably think even less. And so we know, because we're closer to it, um, the really cool things happening in our, our industry and ecosystem. But yeah, it raises again that really interesting question of what's the job of the NZ Tech story? Uh, it's mm. not just to make New Zealand feel good about itself. It's maybe to help lay the um, conditions overseas for our exports and companies and investment and all of the rest of it to do better. So yeah, it's really interesting to go into these differences between, um, between, between what we think. And yeah, what would you have to expand on that, Louise, that idea of what we're hearing from people who maybe are friendlies is, is that they are not entirely sure yet? I think that that in part comes down to the development of the story and the messaging. Um, and one thing that was overwhelmingly came through in the interviews is we need to develop those, those stories that make sense to uh, New Zealand, but also just demonstrating where we're very strong. Um, if you're focusing on um, selling to a tech investor um, that uh, is focused, say, on the agri-tech market, are you developing a story that is ticking their boxes? Uh, you know, they don't have the time or the resource to, to find out about New Zealand, learn about New Zealand. So any kind of messaging that is developed has to be able to be, you know, picked up straight away, pulled out of the noise of the market and standing above the rest of the market. Um, it's, it is something that, that changes and evolves over time. And another thing is that, you know, if we're talking the story in five, five years time, we might be talking about different areas. Um, there's no guarantees that, you know, that it's going to move as fast as, you know, five years time, but it might be even, it might be even um, slower than that. So yeah. 
Um, I think it's it, you, you're always going to get divergent opinions, and that's that's what we've been doing over the last couple of months is you know sorting out those different opinions and how do you counter uh, those those different opinions? Um, because I think that the other thing that came through is we need to be focusing less on our negatives and more on our positives uh, when we're de developing any kind of messaging. So you know. The investors, buyers overseas, they, they don't want to hear about our negatives and how we're countering them. They just want to know, what are your great solutions? What are you doing in terms of stuff that I haven't heard about before? And I think that's, you know, that visibility into those stories of success in New Zealand and that continuing stories of success is something that's missing. Yeah, and if we're seeing, you know, and being very honest about, you know, the way people are seeing us from the outside, that's where the story has to work. So maybe that gives us, uh, you know, ideas about our opportunities to, to tell the world, hey, there are a bunch more zeros and rocket labs in the making here, and it's time you had a, um, a look in. Yeah, and yeah, take us through the slide here, and then we'll bring everyone in for a bit of Q&A. Yeah, so I won't go through this um, in detail, but it's just shown you, we, we pulled out quite a few verbatim quotes when we were developing, um, you know, our, our results of the, the um, sorry, the surveys and also the interviews. Um, but, you know, one of the things that comes through is there's this level of intrigue and interest in New Zealand. So how do you, how do you take hold of that and cultivate it? How do you bring it to the fore and you know we have got all this attention in the last 12 months how do you keep that momentum going how do you sustain that interest in New Zealand um, and that's why you know you can't fall you know can't rest on your laurels you need to be able to develop a continuing evolving story and focusing on what they're asking questions that they're asking um, you know it, it's down the bottom right hand corner, you know, people are saying that we are a great place to live, you know, people want to live in New Zealand, they, you know, given the pandemic, people are saying, well, maybe I should be moving to New Zealand. So what are the opportunities for me as talent in New Zealand? Um, and I think that's, you know, that whole overall, you know, our, our culture, the way that we think, the way that um, we, you know, collaborate, and it's embedded in our DNA that we are innovators, but we're not very good at telling the story about how we are innovating in terms of our commercial terms. Oh, that's so cool. Hey, thank you so much, Louise. Um, I'll bring in now also Randy and Julie back um, for some of the questions. And so I think I'll jump in um, first here. Let me just bring up um, where we are. Yeah, let's let's um let's start with Randy. Uh, we've had a bunch of questions through here. One, do you and thank you for jumping on and answering some of those questions in the Q and A as well. Hey, um, one, one person asking, do you think there's value in trying to attract more large multinational tech companies to establish part of their operations here in New Zealand? And um, yeah, how might might we attract them? I do believe that that is helpful in building the the. Um the base, the sort of the virtual engine to keep this, to bring the talent and to bring the expertise to building great global competitors there. So, and I think because it, New Zealand is so attractive to great talent that these large companies, particularly post COVID, as they think about remote workforces, can think about having a talent base in New Zealand who are interested in living and in, that, in the New Zealand community um, to be able to extend their workforce and their talent base from wherever their base may be, Silicon Valley or Europe or wherever else. So I like the idea of building clusters from, lar from the talent bases from large global competitors and bringing that DNA into New Zealand. Yeah, so cool. Thank you. Um, a question for Julie. Um, one asking about, which is a really good question, as NZ Tech is such a wide basket, um, a question saying, does EdTech feature as a future global tech success story? And is that in the mix here? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a really good question because actually when we were doing the uh, research um, with NZ Tech and, and IDC, um, actually the, ed tech, the actual EdTech sector really stood up in terms of saying they do use the New Zealand story in part of their, their sales pitch. So what we're finding, I think comes back to Simon, what you were saying and also Louise, is that, 
you know, there's there's a lot here to consider. You know, it's it's going to be what is going to be that sort of generic story for New Zealand, and then if we're targeting cer certain countries or was targeting certain buyers. Um, you know, what are going to be those sub-sector stories? Um, and EdTech is obviously, you know, is a success story of New Zealand. Um, so um, so I think that that's probably quite developed compared to some of the other stories. So it's definitely in the mix. But, um, you know, as our, you know, as one of our brand strategists, um, Simon, you know, we've, uh, you've got a job <laughs> to do, to do when we bring this all together. But um, yeah, but we're, we're working very closely with them um, in terms of what we can learn from actually the way they do position themselves internationally. A uh, question that's probably also good for you, Julie, is asking um, from Nicole Upchurch, asking, do you think NZ tech businesses should be working together towards more uh, consortiums? Are we stronger if we work together? And this might be a really interesting place to talk about some of the specialty areas like Agritech, where there's already a New Zealand story, uh, a tech story for Agritech in action. How does that work? And is there more consortium activity happening within the wider tech uh, scene, Julie? Yeah, so I think so. Yeah, so we are, um, as you say, there is already an Agritech story, which was developed in 2019. And NZ Tech is working with NZTE um, and industry at the moment to an Agritech New Zealand in terms of how we activate that. So, you know, and there are other, as you know, with NZ story, there are other stories. I think this is the, it's the challenge, but also the exciting part of the tech story um, on, because as you say, it's, it's wide ranging and broad, but I think it comes back to what Randy said earlier, the, definitely the feedback from the market and what's coming through from the IDC research, the theme is that it is the interconnectedness of New Zealand that is a potential big selling point here. Um, and I think as Nicole asked that question, um, you know, when we collaborate, um, we have a really good actually tech sales pitch um, globally to sell because of the, the skill sets in terms of the way when we when we do collaborate and work together. So we are starting to see that that could become part of the, the, the tech story. Um, I suppose sales and marketing positioning, um, which is, and also our values, that is definitely coming out through um, through the feedback. Um, and as you say, even though if you're selling to an investor or you're trying to grow your business or you're trying to attract, um, you know, talent, you are still positioning the values of the country and the values of the people um, and the values of, of the government, which is all very positive for New Zealand. But Randy, what's your thoughts on that? Because I do think it connects with what you were saying earlier about bringing into that, that kind of collaboration group. Well, I, I mean, I think you and Louise are, are spot on in terms of the issues here facing us in terms of trying to understand how to marshal our strengths in New Zealand yeah. and, to, um, and to do that in a focused way. It's the hardest thing. Because right now, I think the, the frustration in New Zealand is, why can't it win everywhere? <laughs> and, and the reality is no place wins everywhere. Yeah. You're going to have to, there are areas that I think New Zealand has advantages in. And if they can build clusters, and these clusters are self-reinforcing, right? They're not just yeah. consortiums in terms of bringing together energy to sort of tell the story outwards. They're truly a virtuous cycle of bringing in talent and innovation and speeding up the cycle of innovation because the clusters are working closely together because people are moving from company to company. This yeah. is what made Silicon Valley really successful. I think people look at Silicon Valley today and they think about it in a, in a way that is very different than the gestation that made Silicon Valley important. What made Silicon Valley important was that it created a cluster in the semiconductor space. And that created, that drew talent, not just from the United States, but from around the world, because they saw the best and the brightest in a single industry. And then as they began to move out of their company, looking at the new innovation areas, they created personal computers and mainframe computers and the internet and media. And these came because talent came to Silicon Valley, not because Silicon Valley decided where they were going to go and develop their talent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, look, it's so, so magic. Um, thank you very much to the panelists for jumping in and answering the questions on the Q&A. Um, a little message from the team that if you do still have questions you'd like answered, please, please. do chuck them into the Q&A there and then uh, our panelists and uh, the NZ Tech team will come back to you with details there. Um, we're going to wrap up now as that is our hour. Um, here are some details on the screen about ways that you can find out more about the project, get involved, contribute and, um, and, and keep up with it. Uh, but that just leaves me to say... Um, 
thank you so much for everyone for being along today. Thank you to Louise Francis of IDC, Randy Commissar and Julie Gill from NZ Tech. Uh, and thank you very much everyone for having us along today. Uh, hi there. Thanks, Simon. And everyone enjoy Tech Week. Thank yeah. you. It's a thank pleasure. You, everyone. Great. Well, thanks so much, team. Cheers. Bye-bye.